Um, thank you all for attending the neuroprosthesis webinar today. Um, Bob can't be with us, but uh, asked me to introduce our speaker, and it's a real honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Rory Cooper, who is a FISA Foundation and PVA professor and a distinguished professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Science and Technology at the University of Pittsburgh, the founding director uh, and a VA senior research career scientist for the Human Engineering Research Laboratories. Uh, an extensive CV, I couldn't read all 100 pages before getting on. Um, to me, as a veteran, probably the most important thing is that, that Rory himself is a veteran um, and knows a lot about the needs of our, our VA population, but uh, Rory has published over 350 peer-reviewed papers, 2,000 conference papers, a number of invited national and international talks across the world, has 28 patents, um, and has, has mentored and taught a number of postdoctoral students, uh, multiple PhDs awarded under his watch, and a, a real leader in the field of rehabilitation engineering. So, Rory, um, I could say a lot more, but I'm going to let you do the talking because that's what people really want to hear. Thank you for joining us today and uh, giving us the talk. Well, thank you, Ron. Thanks for that generous introduction. It's uh, um, actually, I enjoy going to Cleveland, even though you know that uh, we're rival cities, but uh, uh, um, uh, this is, I guess, in this COVID-19 world, this is kind of the next best thing. And uh, I truly appreciate the opportunity. Uh, actually, I feel a little bit like a fish out of water because I'm not sure I'm a, I'm a neural prosthesis kind of person or but uh, hopefully uh, you'll still be interested in what I have to say. So I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Um, I do have some videos, so you'll see I'm gonna share with, with sound. And and I get, assume every, can you see my screens? Just give me a thumbs up or. Great, wonderful. So um, if you uh, get the chance to uh, come to Pittsburgh, please uh, let me know. Uh, I know uh, Pat's been here, Hunter's been here a few times. Uh, it's great to see both of you and uh, Tom as well, uh, all longtime friends of mine. Um, we're located in, uh, for you students, you might find this interesting. We're located in a place called Bakery Square, which is an old Nabisco cookie factory. Um, it probably was a nicer place before we moved in because they made vanilla wafers. And now we do research, uh, but it's, uh, it's been transformed into a research park. And it's kind of an exciting place to work, to be honest. We have uh, Google is in there. Uh, the uh, Carnegie Mellon as part of its Software Engineering Institute. Now Phillips Research is in the space as well. And uh, the University of Pittsburgh and the VA Pittsburgh's rehab research. So, uh, and as well, funny thing, because Google is such a dominant player, uh, because uh, Google requires that there's a, a bar, a dry cleaner, a gym, restaurants, all of those sort of things. So it makes it kind of an interesting uh, place to do research um, and uh, kind of an academic environment with also kind of a corporate research uh, vibe as well. So. Uh, Love to have you come and see us. So I, I'll start with kind of two things. Um, so those of you might, like some of you that have been around for a while might have recognized the picture on the right that was uh, from the cover of the IEEE Spectrum magazine uh, a few years ago. Um, I, I like to try to encourage all of the, everybody that we, you know, we need more heroes. We know about our sports heroes. We know about our, uh, um, uh, entertainment heroes, music heroes. And more recently, we've learned about uh, epidemiologists and physicians as heroes, but we still need engineers. Um, for those who got on early, you know, it was engineers that made the, that in Pittsburgh, that made the uh, fer nasopharyngeal swabs. Um, so we have a use. The other thing is that uh, uh, you might've heard of the Rusk Institute in New York. Um, Howard Rusk was a, a physician. He's created the Rusk Institute, but you might not know about him as he also was in charge of the uh, rehabilitation programs for our, our service members and veterans during World War II. He happened to be a friend of President Roosevelt. 
And uh, he was one of the pioneers really of uh, allowing soldiers to continue on active duty after they became severely wounded or injured. Real and, uh, and also for uh, driving the, with the VA to, uh, to help people return to work. I'm gonna, I threw in a couple of things in here. These, I don't think you need to look at the slide too much, but uh, I've very become very interested in um, that we need more inventors, um, not only just scientists and engineers, but uh, we need people that are creating new intellectual property in the United States, and then hopefully uh, bringing that out. And uh, these are actually some references to why that's important. Um, what you might be a little bit uh, interesting is in 2018 was the first year when more U.S. patents were awarded to inventors living outside the United States than living inside the United States. And so uh, an invention has a, is, has, is a huge economic uh, driver as well. And uh, universities probably recognize that too. I've, I've been in academia long enough where before people even cared about that. But, uh, but after the passage of the Bayh-Dole Act and uh, as universities realized that uh, uh, I'd had to start reporting on how well they did on technology translation and invention, I think they made it a, a bit of a higher priority. Um, I guess all today, you know, here I'm a veteran. I'm also, uh, I also have a spinal cord injury uh, that I sustained while serving in the army, and um, and so we, uh, uh, yeah, you know, the inventions have a huge social impact. Um, one of the things that I, you know, enjoy talking to people about is that, uh, you know, I I have on my wheelchair I think four or five different of my own inventions that uh, have been commercialized that I use, and they allow me to continue to be uh, um, healthy and active and. Uh, and to participate in society and continue to work and hopefully uh, contribute uh, not only to your education, but to contribute to society at large. Along those lines, uh, one of the things I think is also important is for us to reach out uh, to encourage more young people to become scientists and engineers. And uh, that I think is even more important as, uh, especially as, uh, as as faculty members and even in the VA as as a, as senior scientists um, to make sure there's more there's people in the pipeline. I, I like to use this particular uh, story because uh, Whiz Pop Bang is a is a magazine for middle schoolers that uh, uses uh, science and engineering and technology to motivate middle schoolers to go on to, to stay in science education and go on to become scientists and engineers. And uh, what's fun about it is they, um, every issue, uh, they highlight a scientist or an engineer from somewhere in the world that's uh, on the focus of the theme of the magazine that month. And this month, the focus, the month that I was in, happened to, the focus happened to be on wheels and the importance of the wheel. Uh, and I don't think anybody would argue that the wheel is not one of the world's uh, most important inventions. Not that I was around when it was invented, but um, certainly I benefit highly from the from the wheel itself. I'm going to go back. So I'm going to give you a little. Uh, this little, I'm going to show you a video that was uh, uh, produced by Google. A little bit about our lab, about one of our um, our students. I tell people frequently, and I really mean this. It's kind of like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. I get to play with robots and all these technologies. Our ambition is to apply engineering and advanced technology to improve the mobility and function of individuals with disabilities. A large number of them are our veteran population. Hey. Every day that you come in, there's this kind of wonderful energy here. From students to staff to faculty, we wouldn't really be living up to our our mission if we didn't include people with disabilities in all aspects of what we do. Our vision is a world where everyone with a disability can participate on a level playing field to their greatest extent possible. 
I've got a disability, you know. I certainly wouldn't think of myself as disabled, but it was having a huge impact on my life, on my wife and my children. We can do better than that. We, we have to do better than that. So I work here because I want to give everyone an equal opportunity to whatever they want. Disability shouldn't be the thing that prevents them from getting those things. So I hope you enjoyed that. I, you know, I'd like the thing also with that we, uh, I firmly believe in is we have a, a lot of uh, people with disabilities as scientists and engineers in our lab, women, uh, uh, people from different ethnic, cultural backgrounds, and also engineers. I'm a firm believer that you know diversity is is extremely important to be to creativity and and to success. Um, also, uh, you know, like Cleveland, we have strong links to the clinic, and uh, those are, I think are extremely important as well. And uh, we want to stay grounded in sort of the what the, the real problems are. Um, for those of you that were our students or listen to the students, but you know, when I was a graduate student, my professor asked me what I wanted to do for my PhD dissertation, um, if I had any ideas. And I told him, it's not that I don't have any ideas. My problem is I have millions of ideas. I've got to find one to, uh, to, to focus on because people with disabilities are just faced with a, a multitude of problems. Um, fortunately, we've solved some of those. Uh, we've learned a lot more about others, and there are still some that we still have to work on. Um, but it's great to be engaged in the clinician in the uh, with the uh, clinic as well. If you look at the lower left-hand screen, I just want to point that out. That's our Center for Assistive Technology. First, acknowledge my wife, who's a physical therapist and professor at the University of Pittsburgh as well. And uh, we do a lot of collaborative research together. And I like the fact that the person in the wheelchair that she is talking, talking with is um, not her client. He is her colleague, uh, Dr. Jung Bae Kim, who is now a professor at Yonsei University in Korea. So I'm a firm believer in the participatory action design and engineering paradigm. Uh, which basically means you have user engagement throughout the entire uh, design and engineering process and all the way into uh, hopefully into uh, becoming a clinical practice guideline and, and evidence of best practice and changes in policy. Um, there are uh, several reports. I've had the privilege to contribute to a few of them that have uh, shown that uh, Technology does promote social mobility, health, and participation. From the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine, as well as from the National Research Council and even uh, globally. Um, so uh, and the other thing is it's important is that people with disabilities be included in that research uh, and engaged in the research. Um, one of the things that you get to do when you get a little more established in your career as maybe branch out into some other areas and just wanted to kind of deviate for just a moment because uh, I think that uh, we have a real challenge to um, open up STEM opportunities for people with disabilities, students with disabilities. Unfortunately, in many states or commonwealths like in Pennsylvania, um, science is not compulsory after middle school. And many students with disabilities are, are guided to um, non-STEM careers. And I think that is, a, is to their detriment as also the detriment of society. And I've done some studies with colleagues on, on that problem and what are some of the barriers. And, uh, um, and those barriers still are from that, despite the fact that the Americans with Disabilities Act is over 30 years old now, that, that a lot of places have not fully implemented the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, this, another barrier is that uh, um, the non-fixed barriers like laboratory equipment and lab benches and instruments and things like that are, have not been made accessible to many people with disabilities. And unfortunately, a lot of teachers, middle school, high school, college and university teachers really don't know how to teach science and engineering to people with disabilities. Uh, 
Um, also, I just want to, as a veteran and also working in the VA, I'm very interested in, in veterans transition issues, especially, of course, technology can help with that as well. And, um, and we need to work on helping the military civilian divide as well as uh, helping uh, veterans once they become wounded, injured, or ill to, uh, to find ways to transition successfully into their communities and, and contribute their talents. So let me uh, get into our research a little bit. Um, we have we started uh, several years ago to really formally collect information from, from consumers. Uh, this is a sample of a thousand people. We've, we've, we've got now a pool of over 2000 people. Uh, we're doing a, starting a new study here pretty soon, uh, looking at uh, uh, autonomous uh, vehicles and transportation systems and getting consumer feedback on that priorities. Um, this one was basically just to help guide Hurl uh, to in a roadmap that both uh, the VA, DOD, uh, NIH have all said has been needed for some years, uh, also as well as the National Academy. Um, so in that roadmap, we basically found five different focal areas that, that uh, individuals who use assistive technology currently uh, wanted to focus, want to see uh, greater research in. Um, and those areas are advanced wheelchair design. There's some subcategories under there, uh, as well as uh, smart device applications, which um, not too, uh, 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 that seems pretty logical. Well, there's the, with the widespread use of uh, wearable devices now, um, and also, uh, and smartphone technologies, and what that tremendous benefit that can, that has had and continue to have for, for individuals who use assistive technology. Uh, better human machine interfaces, which is in some ways what neural prostheses are, right? They are a, uh, um, they are an actuator. They're, I mean, you could argue they're kind of balanced between the human machine interfaces and the assistive robot and intelligent systems priorities um, as well. And so, um, and I know that you're doing in, in Cleveland some DCI work as well, brain computer interface. And then the other one was kind of a broader prior nets this particular design and, and research, which included more universal design and policy and practice, uh, greater access to education, more development of standards and reliability, and, and actually more uh, better dissemination, which actually led us to another study. Because one of the interesting things about that, when you ask people, we asked both end users, we also asked over 250 clinicians that provided assistive technology, what should we be working on? Um, we got a lot of people that told us, uh, asked us about things to work, that we asked us to work on things that work very well and are commercially available. And uh, that led us to ask the question, where are they getting, where are people getting their information? What are the primary sources of information? And um, as you might expect, those primary sources of information are, are the, the web, uh, primarily through uh, um, just simply doing searches on search, various search engines. Um, then also uh, family and friends and, uh, and in, uh, from conferences and meetings, you know, like disability expos. And uh, so um, we are lucky we, uh, over the last few years have been able to recruit a couple of uh, uh, AI and machine learning experts away from the banking industry to uh, perhaps do some more uh, human good uh, and, uh, and, and, and be part of our group and work with us. And Allison, they, they came down with basically these three market segments, uh, which have to be, if you look at the uh, cluster analysis up in the upper left-hand corner, happen to be fairly evenly distributed. Um, there's kind of an interesting thing about this that the, uh, um, the veterans were kind of equally split between being uh, uh, disengaged and engaged. And that the uh, interesting about the group that was most engaged were the, they were the older ones, uh, which is kind of contrary to what you'd normally hear when you talk about uh, people being informed, especially usage of the internet. But I think that has to, I think that has to 
that goes to show the, uh, you know, it's been around long enough, over 20 years, that the individuals that are older are also now grown up using the internet, and they use it quite frequently to stay connected. But it does give us some a little bit of guidance on how we might best target it, target dissemination of our information. So now I'm gonna change gears on you a little bit and go into some of the actual uh, research that we've been doing. Um, these are probably images you're not used to seeing in, in your curriculum. Uh, I started uh, for over three decades ago, uh, looking at wheelchair quality uh, in order to uh, help reduce the risk of, of injury and also to, uh, to help determine how often should a wheelchair be replaced because that's a common uh, challenge faced by individuals who use wheelchairs that require assistance from insurance companies. And it's interesting, I'm currently on a, a committee for the National Academies looking at increasing accessibility of airline transportation. And we're relying heavily on standards for both aircraft and for wheelchairs. So uh, the, if you look in the upper right, those are just some common failures that you might see. Uh, for those of you that have an undergraduate engineering degree, you should recognize some of them because it's pretty common that you know when you have a stress rise or a hold at a high stress area, that's a that's a common possible area for failure. The other one is if you have a groove or a thread uh, in a high stress area, it's also an, a, a possible common failure. If you look at the C, it's probably the clearest image. You can actually see that that's a fatigue failure because of this the uh, telltale signs of a wave mark. Um, but if we shift your gaze now to the bottom right-hand corner, those are Kaplan-Meier survival curves. And uh, there's a vertical solid line uh, somewhere around 400, at 400,000 equivalent cycles, actually. And uh, that is the FDA requirement. All wheelchairs should fail or should last a fail after that line, to the right of that line. And uh, what's a little bit uh, disturbing about this is these are wheelchairs approved by the FDA and, and uh, purchased after market. And if you see, there's a large percentage of them, uh, in fact, most of them fail uh, before that vertical line. And uh, uh, the Interesting left is the ultralight aluminum wheelchairs, they uh, tend to perform the best, which is a little bit surprising because you would have thought that the ultralight titanium wheelchairs might have performed better. And that, but that probably has to do with familiarity with the ultralight aluminum wheelchairs and also um, the, the number of uh, units that are produced. So the quality assurance has probably gotten better. So um, just, you know, this is going to be like a, a more like a, a smorgasbord of research projects over the years. But uh, um, so the smart wheel, if you're not familiar with it, is a device that I actually invented as a graduate student uh, to uh, actually to try to perform better in the Paralympic Games. And then uh, as, a, as I advanced in my education, I learned that uh, there is a huge uh, problem of rotator cuff injuries and carpal tunnel syndrome among manual wheelchair users, especially after five years. So if you go back in time to the 1990s, about 80% of manual wheelchair users developed carpal tunnel syndrome or rotator cuff injury within the first five years of use. Fortunately, due to the smart wheel and the products that it's enabled, it was, uh, it's, that has now been reduced to about 20%. And I'm really not sure that you can do too much better than 20% um, by addressing the wheelchair because you still have to look at transfers and other activities that people perform that could also place them at risk for carpal tunnel syndrome and rotator cuff injuries. Um, so if you want to, I need to say some other inter hopefully interesting stories here. Um, so these two images up here, these are ultrasounds. So in the 1990s, it really was very difficult to do an ultrasound image 
to actually look at the soft tissue in the, in the shoulder and the wrist. And we actually worked with uh, companies to help develop um, high frequency ultrasound to do those types of images. Another challenge with ultrasound is this is the uh, um, median nerve in the carpal canal looking down the wrist, down the, uh, as if you were in the you know, forearm looking towards the wrist. Uh, is the other problem with the ultrasound is you try to get a register two images the same way. So if you've ever done an ultrasound or ever seen an ultrasound being done, you'll see that there's a lot of moving of the head around and it's, it's really hard to see the same thing twice. Uh, so that's actually when we worked on making these little uh, stainless steel A's and then use a little colostomy cement and tape. And that allowed us that on the ultrasound showed up as these two vertical lines which allowed us to get uh, two images, so, which we used then to do pre and post activity measurements to determine uh, whether the, uh, to de help determine causality about the wheelchair setup and the type of force applied. These graphs here we are on the lower left, they show the, uh, the forces uh, applied to the push rim. And this is simply if you move the axle further forward, you can reduce the stroke frequency increase the stroke length and, uh, and get actually more power and I even get a little bit more speed for the same amount of effort. Uh, this actually, this smart wheel then led to a, a number of ergonomic inventions. Um, two of them I just wanted to highlight which are the, um, the surge and the natural fit which became commercially available and uh, change from people using a, a pinch grip to using more of a tool grip, which helped further reduce the risk of, of developing carpal center, carpal syndrome or rotator cuff injury. Um, it also led to some other uh, interesting inventions. Um, if you're familiar with uh, ever push a wheelchair down the sidewalk, sidewalks tend to be sloped towards the road uh, for drainage. Um, and if you, uh, um, find, then you find out that the side towards the street, you have to push your arm much harder. And so uh, uh, I adopted some technology that I invented back in the 1980s, early 1990s for wheelchair racing, which we called the crowd compensator. And if you want to look it up, you can find it in the journal Rehabilitation Research Development back in the early 1990s or maybe the late 1980s. Um, and uh, basically it allows the, it uses a magnet or a, or a ball lock pin or a ball and a, and a spring and a ball to bias the caster to want to go straight. And then if you lift that lever, the locking lever up, the caster can swivel freely. And this allows people to uh, go down the sidewalk or uh, with uh, pushing uh, um, without having to constantly compensate with the arm on the downward slope side. It actually had a couple of interesting, not directly um, intended consequences. So uh, uh, one of them was that um, it allowed people to get an ultralight wheelchair and use it as a one-arm drive. Uh, so individuals with uh, stroke or um, other uh, uh, limitations restricted the use of the one arm uh, they, uh, they could use this to uh, have a very lightweight, easy to use wheelchair to go. Thing. The other thing was interesting where you learn about when people actually adopt the technology is uh, people started using it just to get from one place to another. For example, carrying a coffee cup or carrying a cookie in their hand uh, so they could push it with one hand and hold it with another hand. On the right is the glide. Uh, if you want to have fun uh, looking that up, the patent is called the Oblique Angle Suspension Caster Fork. Um, when things get commercialized, they come up with uh, cooler names. Uh, and the glide addresses partially the, the uh, problem I showed you earlier about the wheelchair failures by adding a, uh, a suspension element here in the, uh, in the wheel, uh, just like a motorcycle with a monoshock suspension. Here's the pivot point. And then the wheelchair swivels about this point. And that allows those bumps that when you hit door thresholds, 
tree roots, sidewalk cracks, things like that, to be absorbed. Uh, and uh, it has actually twofold. It helps the wheelchair last longer, um, makes the wheel, and it makes the the wheelchair user more comfortable and also safer because most tips and falls occur when the casters catch on a small item and, and the person uh, slides or falls forward out of the chair. So um, another challenge is that, uh, um, uh, un, uh, I should have pointed this out when I was in the carpal tunnels research, but one of the number one things that anybody can do to help reduce the risk of developing rotator cuff injuries or carpal tunnel syndrome among wheelchair users is to have them maintain a healthy body weight. And uh, if they uh, don't, then uh, it increases their risk. But one of the challenges is it's very difficult to maintain a healthy body weight uh, because you're just typically not as active. And uh, the activity monitors, um, unfortunately, are now getting better, uh, but a lot of them don't are not really uh, very functional for for individuals who use wheelchairs. And so we uh, been working on that. This is the WheelFit app. Uh, if I'm just going to call your attention to the uh, to the graph here on the lower right hand side of your screen because um, it. I think it's kind of relevant to all research and how people respond. So uh, the light blue is people sleeping. The darker blue is uh, is a sedentary when people are sedentary, and the um, the the uh, the cream colored is when people are are moving or lightly active, and actually the and the red is when people are actually exercising. Um, so there's a couple rather um, concerning things about this graph. And this is aggregate data from about 50 people. Um, so one thing that should stand out to everybody is that on Thursday evenings, there's a red, there's a big section of red. And what happened on Thursday evenings is when the graduate student went to visit them. So just like everybody else, right, when you, uh, know that you're going to get a visit, somebody's going to personally check on you, then you're um, more likely to comply. Now, I found that rather interesting because people were being monitored constantly, right? When they're awake and they were asleep, yet they uh, still, uh, uh, when it was still very difficult to get to them to increase their exercise, except when somebody personally came in. Um, and then, uh, uh, the other thing is it's kind of frightening is just the amount of sedentary activity during the course of a day or a week uh, that people have. So that's something we have to change. So uh, one of the ways to help change that is something that's in common with all weight loss programs is the ability to weigh yourself. Yet uh, many uh, people with disabilities can't regularly weigh themselves. They just can't simply get on a bathroom scale and, and find out what their weight is and actually wind up getting weighed uh, you know, once a year, uh, sometimes even less frequently. And that's very difficult to manage your weight if you don't know what it is. And so um, we worked on uh, addressing that problem um, by creating a bed, an uh, intelligent bed scale. And, uh, if you look on the, those are the, the, the bottom left corner there, those are the bits. Cause I, I like that picture because it shows uh, both the quantity and the quality of the technology that Hurl can develop for its studies. So we, uh, we made these in house and then we, um, we placed them under people's uh, beds. And then we had to make them, so there's one under each, each foot of the bed. So four sensors, they're all integrated together. They talk to a smartphone, they share the data to the cloud. And uh, we had to use some, a little bit of machine learning uh, uh, in AI because you could have two people in bed, the person could sleep with their dog. Uh, and to, we had to be able to do uh, disambiguate or differentiate when it was one or two people and what the approximate, you know, fairly accurate representation of the weight was of both people. Uh, 
Um, and that's actually other interesting uh, features because we could find out also how often people get up during the night as well as how often they, uh, they rolled over to do pressure relief. And so, uh, and I think we could actually estimate sleep, sleep quality as well. And so, uh, and we also got sleep to, to uh, duration. So it has a, a, a number of different benefits and we'd hope that most people go to bed at least sometime during every day. So I'm gonna uh, now talk about a new project. So the, the virtual CD coach was developed uh, basically in order to meet the clinical need that we had identified of people getting power wheelchairs with power seat functions, but their uh, condition uh, not, not improving. And so uh, we did a series of experiments to identify that people would use their power seat functions, but not necessarily as instructed. The idea with the virtual seating coach was to use the advances in technology, uh, but first onboard computing, and later with a, a smartphone technology, to uh, provide that coaching in real time, contextually aware, uh, all the time available to the user, and to provide that data to the cloud, one, so those algorithms could be improved based on what was learned, as well as share that data with clinicians in order to improve their clinical practice and eventually improve uh, clinical practice guidelines. And ultimately the goal is that we use the technology interacting with the user to uh, help the user and get the maximum benefit from the technology they're using. So one of the fun things about that technology is it's now um, integrated into every uh, permobile wheelchair in the world. And uh, it's uh, available for free, uh, which the VA uh, in some ways uh, uh, helped facilitate that because um, when it initially came out, you it was an add-on product and it required connection to a network and uh, uh, if you're familiar with the, you know, connecting a device to the VA network is uh, takes uh, an act of God uh, or something very close to it. Um, and so uh, Permobile eventually decided that maybe a different approach would be to uh, um, take the technology integrated into their wheelchairs and use it to differentiate their wheelchairs from others. Uh, what's most exciting for us is that the uh, it's actually caused about uh, a 25 percent uh, drop in a pressure ulcer a pressure injury incidence among uh, people who use the technology which literally can save uh, millions if not billions of dollars a year in the 50,000 people who are now using it uh, that's also kind of fun to say not too many uh, VA inventors can say that uh, they have, there's 250,000 people using their push rooms and 50,000 people using another one of their technologies and power wheelchairs. That's pretty exciting for us, all of us that work in Hurl, uh, because it is a sort of in, a direct measure of, of the impact that the technology can have on people's lives. So not everybody uses a power wheelchair, uh, which would be obvious. And so we've been really tack, trying to tackle this problem for manual wheelchair users as well, because um, they're also at risk. About 50% of people with spinal cord injuries, for example, who use a wheelchair, will develop a pressure, a pressure injury. And, uh, and the cost of a pressure injury can be, um, is the average cost of a pressure injury per year in the United States per person is about $30,000. So um, to treat it. So that's, it's pretty expensive. It's in the billions of dollars a year. And uh, so um, uh, we've been working that by basically putting an instrumented, uh, uh, instrumenting the seat and then looking uh, primarily at uh, changes in the body weight uh, or the, the uh, seated weight as well as the uh, center of pressure location. And, uh, 
So you, you I think I'll digress for a moment, but I helped lead the Toyota, Toyota Mobility Foundation uh, Mobility Unlimited Challenge, which completed today. And it's exciting that the winner of that competition uh, developed a wheelchair that has a, a, a variable axle position that is controlled by an intelligent system and adjust the axle position based on whether you're on uh, flat ground or going uphill or downhill. And uh, what I think is exciting, just like our this virtual seating coach, is that I think that manual wheelchairs are going to have more instrumentation, more electronics in the future as well, and be also more cloud connected. Um, so if you look at this graph in the sort of the bottom center, the um, those are uh, the results of machine learning, primarily K cluster analysis. Uh, on the left shows that we can see uh, a left lean, a right lean, a forward lean in neutral sitting. And then on the right, we can see when a person does a wheelchair uh, push up. And so uh, that allows that the uh, system to uh, coach. Now, as you saw, like with the power wheelchair one, we really want to be a virtual coach, not a virtual nag, right? So what good coaches do is, uh, is help you learn what to do right at a time when you're uh, susceptible to listening to it, rather than just constantly telling what you're doing wrong. So they, what you want to do is teach people how to, do, how, to, how to help take care of themselves. So as you might expect, some people just aren't going to do, they're just not able to, either physically, cognitively able, or are just uh, um, for some other reason, they're not going to uh, adequately be, be doing pressure release. And so uh, the, uh, uh, we've been working with the University of Texas Applied Research Institute, UCARI, and uh, developing a, an active cushion that uh, where the uh, individual cells adjust their pressure in order to minimize the pressure over the seated surface. So, that's illustrated in the upper right-hand corner here. We actually used a, an instrumented buttocks that we developed for uh, not only for this study, but also for looking at uh, seats in, in vehicles and vibra uh, you know, other vehicles, like motor vehicles and, and helicopters to look at pressure distribution and the vibration and uh, exposure. And then we um, loaded the uh, cushion. So, uh, and this is basically the internal pressure uh, if you look at the uh, colored blue uh, screen, that's the internal pressure of the uh, uh, with the loaded, and then that's what a, we put a commercial pressure mapping system on it. That's what you see, and you, there's pretty good sort of visual correlation there. Uh, to be honest, as an engineer, I think our data is more accurate than the uh, the, the overlay pressure mapping system, which people know are notoriously notoriously inaccurate. Um, if we look at the scale on the bottom, I thought it's kind of interesting, uh, or at least I think it is. There's a, just basically this, the cushion inflated. Then we have a person seated on it. You can see the red and the yellow highlighted areas and, and, and in figure B. And then uh, uh, typically what a clinician would do is, is offload the areas of high risk. Uh, in this case, normally the tip what we call the ischial tuberosities. Um, then we thought, you know what, if we've got uh, measurements, we can instantly just redistribute the load in order to uh, minimize the pressure and then pressure gradient over the entire surface, which we call redistributed. And what you can see is we're able to get with this same person, uh, get, all, get all into, uh, Sort of blue, different shades of blue, a little bit of, a little bit of green, uh, in there as well. But actually, did better than the standard of care, which is offload. Hi, my name is Joshua Zhong. I am a researcher at the Human Engineering Research Labs. My research project is focused on the performance evaluation and the user interface of the 
assistive robotic manipulators. So the assist robotic arms is that a robotic arm can be mounted on the wheelchairs and uh, that can assist uh, wheelchair users or people with the disability to do uh, some daily tasks uh, using the control interface. So, so the reason we developed the interface is that uh, we have tests with the uh, current uh, robotic original interfaces and uh, a lot of users have difficulty learning those uh, either take some memorize the keys or memorize the command or combination of uh, different keystrokes. So the interface we de developed kind of a reduce those uh, frustration so they can quickly learn how to use, uh, control the robot and they can do the task just uh, within 10 minutes. There was one veteran look at our robot and he's so, so ex he was so excited and he, he said, he just point to the robot and, and saying to the, the caregiver, that's what I want. So I, I think the robot would be really helpful for people sitting in a chair and still want to achieve something for their lives. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I just want to point out some of the pictures around the outside. Uh, well, um, so if you look at the bottom, bottom left, um, the interesting thing is that even, you know, for the robot to really be widely functional, it required tools. Um, what I uh, saw, these were 3D, the nice thing about, we use the additive manufacturing or 3D printing, commonly, commonly called 3D printing, to make a, like a device to be able to hold a, a toothbrush or spoon or something like that, a key mounted in it. Also the, uh, uh, for like a Tupperware holder. Um, of course, as you might expect, there had, had, had two other sort of interesting spin-offs. Uh, one of them was that um, the, uh, uh, the occupational therapists we work with actually really liked the modifications that we made and asked us to simply make the modifications. And a lot of people uh, that would have been candidate for a robot that could actually uh, achieve pretty decent independence with just simple modifications. But then another interesting spin-off, one of my graduate students, Ben Salatine, then later went to the VA and started the 3D printing network, and uh, which is now run by Beth Ripley, and, uh, and is used to, uh, and now they have 3D printers in a lot of the different uh, uh, OT departments that are across the VA, simply to make these sort of um, one-off or custom devices for veterans. So um, it's kind of cool that it had its uh, origins in Hurl uh, related to our research. And just another fun sort of fact is that uh, we've been working to try to work, use robots to help do meal preparation and meal cleanup. And so one of our projects is to have a robot uh, help people to uh, make pancakes. And believe it or not, even with the premix pancake batter, there's over a hundred steps to make a pancake. And uh, um, robots can make pancakes, but um, they can't really make good pancakes. Um, I just wanted to show that another, so uh, this is Alec. Uh, this is my wife, Rosie, in the background again. Um, Alec is a was a research participant and is actually uh, in the process of getting a robotic arm for uh, for daily use. Um, Alec, uh, you can see, had limited upper extremity mobility. Uh, actually, was uh, unable to to use a, a, the wheelchair. Had limited use of using a wheelchair and it couldn't use a uh, couldn't pick up things on his own or feed himself without assistance. And so uh, Alec came to us and asked us if we could help him out. So this is the, uh, up in the gray on the upper right, that's the, uh, the CAD model for an interface for the robotic arm. Um, Alec also said, I can't use my phone without assistance. If you could find a way to capture my phone in the controller, I could use the, the phone as well as use the phone to help assist with driving a wheelchair as you 
saw in the previous, or driving the robot as you saw in the previous video. And then down below, you can see the 3D printing with a, a little uh, a thumb joystick or um, the zero throw joystick, something that we actually invented in the 1990s. And then, uh, um, and then his phone captured in there, which actually gives him feedback on the robot. Hey, good evening, DAV. Dan Clare, I'm here at the National Disabled Veterans Winter Sports Clinic, a great, great event that we do with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and, and I'm here in a room where very important things happen at this event every year. Human Engineering Research Laboratories, in partnership with the VA and the University of Pittsburgh, they do this great research every year that changes the lives of veterans way beyond the event. They're testing wheelchairs, they're testing um, transfers, things like that. They're doing research that changes veterans' lives every day. And one of the great things we have here is past AV National Commander, Dave Riley and, and DAV's, uh, DAV's event ambassador, and Dr. Rory Cooper, a great friend of DAV with Human Engineering Research Laboratories. Dr. Cooper, thank you so much. Dave Riley, as you can see, um, is a quadruple amputee. So Dave's, Dave doesn't have, doesn't have hands. And that makes it a little bit difficult, especially for someone with a computer science background to operate a mouse. So last year, Dave talked to Dr. Cooper. They got together and they came up with this device. Tell us about it, Dr. Cooper. Yeah, it's, uh, it's basically an adapted computer mouse that uh, we designed and actually patented uh, to uh, be compatible with a prosthetic hook. So it's got like a, like Dave's using right now, it's got kind of a dead zone, neutral zone, and then it's got the left button, right button for left click, right click. It allows you to also drag and click, but also for right maneuvering, click, left click. Left click. Um, so that you can use a mouse just like anybody else. Dave, how's it different for you to try and use something? Like oh, it's this? much better than, you know, I, I used to use uh, the eye eyeglasses with, uh, you know, it tracks your pupils and then you use voice assistant, but this is just like using a mouse again almost. I mean, it's uh, very uh, mobile. We found on the mouse pad we're going to do something, but, um, you know, the buttons are right here. We're going to tighten up that little hole there so it's not as much wobble, but... Common question I get is how do people afford to use these technologies? And this is an example of we took a technology that cost about four thousand dollars and reduced it to about twenty-five dollars. And the VA dis distributes these set people free to veterans who um, who can benefit through their OT programs or the, through the uh, MPT care centers. Even in the kitchen, where something as simple as preparing meals can be a real challenge. This kitchen is designed for people with Alzheimer's and brain injury. This is the queuing kitchen, where specially designed computer programs provide cues or step-by-step -step instructions for cooking things like pasta. When I click next, the program will give me my first instruction on, on how do I get started with making pasta. Take out cooking pot from the lighted cabinet. Take out pasta from the transparent cabinet. Fill the cooking pot with water from the water faucet. Turn the faucet off. Place cooking pot on the stove. Turn on the stove. This program is ideal for someone with cognitive or memory loss problems. But for those who need more help, there's this futuristic device called the Kitchen Bot. The Kitchen Bot can turn a faucet on and off. It can also open cabinets and drawers and operate appliances. It's a sophisticated instrument that moves up, down, and sideways and can be programmed for a specific or a group of functions. And it's kind of evolving as we collect more data and work. So the ability to transfer is also important. So this was our, another one I've mentioned, is the robotic assisted transfer device, or we call the strong arm, where you can see Mark in this case um, is transferring a rescue dummy from the wheelchair 
uh, to another surface. This is a, a shot shower bench. The idea is that the robot can actually runs on a track and can transfer, sit behind the person to stay within the footprint or uh, move from the left side to the right side and then help, help with transfers. Um, and I think this is gonna really be beneficial for uh, people they go stay on trips or travel or uh, in confined spaces or going to a shopping center or a mall or something like that. Um, rather than taking one of the, you can't really take an overhead lift or one of the, uh, the floor lifts as well with you. Um, now, some people are, uh, you know, the uh, are not, it's getting the sling underneath them and helping with transfers is extremely challenging. So uh, this is a work, a robotic wheelchair, robotic bed that we've been working on where they work together to essentially pour the person um, into bed. So you can see the backrest moves out of the way. Now the, uh, the wheelchair, the bed moves up to serve as the backrest. They're a little, the kinetics or kinematics are a little out of sync in this video, but, uh, and the person's kind of poured into the bed and there's a conveyor over the bed. Um, I, I just want to tell you briefly a little story. Well, we demonstrated this in the, our long-term care facility in Pittsburgh for veterans. And as we did, there was one of the veterans uh, wives, uh, she came to visit us and she uh, spent quite a bit of time with us and then she and had it demonstrated on herself. And then she left and she came back about an hour later with her husband's physician and said, um, I want you to prescribe one of these and so that I can take my husband home. And uh, actually we hurried up. Uh, we worked with our industry partner uh, and the VA uh, to make one and uh, provide it to the veteran. And, he was able to go home again after three years of being in a long-term care facility, which led to another veteran spouse coming and we had to provide a second one. So it's, got, it's pretty, pretty moving sometimes when you, uh, when you can see firsthand how these technologies can change people's lives. Um, I will I'll just talk about this slide briefly. So this is, these are the drawings for the, uh, a patent of mine, the uh, our, of ours from Hurl, actually the uh, variable compliance joystick with variable with uh, compensation algorithms, uh, and you can see it's one of the illustrations here. I only wanted to bring it up because um, the uh, this tech when this technology was invented, it act it became on the market. So the VA patented it, and then chose for humanitarian reasons to allow any wheelchair company to use the technology as long as they didn't prohibit another company or, uh, from using the technology. So it's basically a royalty-free license. Um, the, uh, the interesting effect was between that and the, uh, so that enabled the mid-wheel drive wheelchair. Uh, it also made front-wheel drive wheelchairs better uh, and it made it possible for a lot of people to, uh, to drive wheelchairs. And so, well, uh, Although the scary thing was it, it drove uh, a 40% growth in the uh, power wheelchair market, which um, uh, caused me to get a, first a call from the VA central office to come and say, um, what has happened? Why is there this huge growth in expenditure? And then you get called to the centers of Medicare and Medicaid services. And essentially what had happened was we had helped meet the pent up demand of a lot of people who were not able to drive independently or who had very limited independent mobility uh, and were either being uh, uh, driven with what we call an attendant propelled power chair, the joystick was on the back or used by somebody else, or they were in a manual chair propelled by somebody else. And of course, uh, when the opportunity arose that they could go places where they wanted to go when they wanted to go, uh, they they jumped on it. And so uh, uh, it, it was interesting. Uh, the political consequences were interesting, although I will credit both the VA and Centers for Medicare Medicaid Services. They, uh, they, um, they allocated the funds and uh, eventually, of course, the, the, the growth started to uh, to level out after the, the new technology was fully integrated and demand was starting to be met. But 
they did wind up, both of them wind up spending a lot more money on, on power wheelchairs, basically wherever after. This is our, our PERMA, our Pulsar Mobility Manipulation Appliance. The, uh, it's a, but sort of the first robotic wheelchair with bimanual robotic manipulators. The manipulators and the base work uh, together. Uh, we worked on this uh, as an NSF project because uh, you know, there's a lot of tasks that are bimanual tasks and really you have to coordinate both mobility and manipulation in order to achieve a uh, pretty seamless mobility like you see Elaine doing here, who's using a combination of a tablet and voice control to drive the chair and the arms. And uh, but it was a fun study. We worked with sociologists as well. We got approval from the store manager, but the customers and the store employees were unaware of the study going on. We wanted to see how people would respond to a robot in the community as well as how well the robot would work in the community. And so um, there's something unusual about this checkout and that you see that Elaine actually hands her wallet to the person first and then hands the basket. Uh, normally you would have your items rung up and then give the person the wallet. But we um, had to make that change because the people were giving the participants free items they were not charging them because they thought they were so fascinated by the robot. Uh, but you do see that it's a pretty natural interaction. Um, I'm just about done, but this is Dr. Kim again. Um, this is uh, using the MeBot, the Mobile Enhanced Robotic Wheelchair that we've invented uh, with uh, simple uh, controls. Uh, he can, uh, we call this sliding autonomy. He can climb an eight inch curve and stay stable at all times. And what's also kind of cool about this technology is that it, uh, it can sort of reverse it. It's, uh, you think about like a roller coaster on a track, it can, it can cause this thing to go forwards and backwards in case he, uh, it feels uncomfortable at any time. And largely what we did is we, redesigned the power wheelchair to incorporate many of the power seat function type actuators into the base. So you still get eye level conversation like you saw there with Dr. Kim and Dr. Kadiati. And, uh, uh, but you also get high curbs and also um, as I'll show you self leveling. So I just wanna draw your attention briefly to this lower picture on the lower right hand side. It's one of my favorite. Those are all current or former students of mine at Zenit, uh, who are all very severely uh, spinal cord injured. So uh, Zenit was a student of mine from the University of Aachen in Germany. Um, and, uh, and then Dr. Kim and then uh, and Siva is actually a current graduate student of mine. So uh, it's pretty exciting uh, to me to have that many and they're just a number of the, that's just some of the students with spinal cord injury, but it's great that we were all to get, able to get together. Um, so let me just show you. Uh, also, we can use the same technology for uh, self-leveling. So this is actually common. You walk down the sidewalk, somebody walks in front of you and you drop a wheel um, or you miss the curb cut, you wind up in a position like this which caused the wheelchair to roll over sideways and the person to hurt, get hurt. But because of the way that we've designed the MeBot, uh, let's see, uh, Dr. Kadiati here, it uses an inertial measurement unit and actually four sensors to, uh, uh, and what we call sensor fusion or data fusion, to, the, it, to maintain him a level uh, side to side so you can literally get in that situation and drive until you can uh, um, to get to a safe, to safely get all four wheels on the same surface. Um, a lot of tips and falls occur in wheelchairs when you uh, um, are at the transition of ramps. And so this allows the same thing. We're now doing our self-leveling or attitude control uh, in the fore and aft directions. But for some kids, like Sam, water is an obstacle. We typically avoid water parks because we know there's the ladder scaffold involved. You 
have to get up to the slide. And also, the rides in the water parks typically be just aren't good for someone without balance. So that's just in general water parks a challenge. And being in a power wheelchair makes it even more difficult. These wheelchairs run on electricity, and when water comes in contact with them, the results can be shocking. So how do you build a water park that all kids can enjoy? That's the question Gordon Hartman had. He runs the world's first accessible theme park, Morgan's Wonderland in San Antonio. We had to come up with a wheelchair that would uh, allow for it to get wet and still be able to move about uh, through the use of someone's um, ability to uh, use a joystick. That's when he discovered the work of Dr. Rory Cooper at the University of Pittsburgh School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Dr. Cooper is world renowned for numerous patents and inventions when it comes to wheelchair technology. He's dedicated his life to improving assistive devices for people with disabilities. I found Dr. Cooper from the first conversation we had on the phone as a person who really wanted to work hard at ensuring that this idea that we had of developing this chair, which would truly be revolutionary. Gordon and I have the same vision. That's a, a, a world where all everybody can participate together so that people with and without disabilities are on the same playing field. And the idea is, that, hey, an air motor with air tanks, if it's feasible, may uh, provide with a much lighter power chair, uh, much more environmentally friendly that doesn't need to have the batteries replaced. And from that idea, a new chair, short for pneumatic chair, was born. The new chair is powered strictly by compressed air. There's no batteries, so that makes it waterproof. We can recharge it in as little as 10 minutes. Unlike current battery wheelchairs, that could take up to eight hours. It could revolutionize the wheelchair industry. Brandon Daveler, a current graduate student at Pitt School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, is a researcher studying under Rory Cooper. Their team works out of the Human Engineering Research Laboratories, where they modeled and built the new chair. The chair that makes a challenging trip to the water park, well, fun. I like to have the freedom to run around. It was rewarding to see just how he lit up and the enjoyment that he got out of going through the sprinklers and the water. He wants to be independent. Quite frankly, we let him go for 30 minutes by himself, and that's what he wants. And Rory thinks children without disabilities who witness this independence will be influenced too. That's the kind of experiences you want kids to have so that when they grow up, they don't have those biases and they can say, hey, oh, oh I've, you know, I've seen people with disabilities do it just like I have. The positive. We also then developed a scooter version, which we are losing in uh, 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 local Giant Eagle grocery stores. And hopefully after the pandemic is over, there's, there's interest from them in, in actually deploying them through their grocery stores as a, as a safe green technology. So I'm gonna just wrap up with this last video uh, to show you that the, we're going for the Paralympics to show you the power of technology. Yes, I can, suddenly, yes, I can. Gee, I'm afraid to go on as turned into, yes, I can. Take a look, what do you see? 133 pounds of confidence in me. Got the feeling I can do anything, yes, I can. Something that sings in my blood is telling me, yes, I can.
I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Hey, yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Are you ready? I can climb Everest. Yes, I can. I can fight here all night and never rest. Yes, I can. I was just born today. I can go. And then uh, just another fun sort of thing is that uh, in 2019, I was uh, selected to get a U.S. Patent Trademark Office uh, collectible card. Um, these are, uh, you can find it at the website there if you're interested. It's kind of a great way to motivate kids to become scientists and learn about uh, uh, invention as well. Uh, only 28 people in the history of the United States have been so honored and it's Pretty, you could see some of the other people that are uh, in that group, uh, like uh, Thomas Edison, Nicholas Tesla, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Ray Dolby, uh, Ellen Ochoa, Temple Grand, and it's it's pretty fun. It's been a great, great opportunity for me to talk to kids and also inspire them to try to become scientists and engineers. So thank you very much for your time and uh, staying with me on a Thursday before the holidays and uh i really appreciate the opportunity and and I'd also just like to you know thank you for the great work that you're doing as well and especially you students the great work you will be doing and it's it's great to see cheryl cheryl hopefully we'll be able to do the ohio games again soon uh, uh you guys have been great there and uh let us do research there and let me let a pittsburgher actually come over and participate we love having you there all the time. And, uh, you know, it's great to see, uh, I see Byron Marzley and Pat Crago and a lot of my longtime friends uh, here as well. So I'm happy to answer a few questions or, uh, or uh, don't want to keep you away from dinner if that's where we're headed next. Rory, I did want to ask you, you mentioned a lot about engaging our youth in uh, rehab engineering. Um, I wondered your, your um, sort of pearls of wisdom on how we navigate the VA administrative system to get our younger students exposed and engaged with the research work that we're doing. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, great question. Um, so uh, our, our VA, uh, well, well, first, if they're 16 or above, you can, they can come into the VA as volunteers, which is kind of cool. Uh, so we do use work with our volunteer services on that. Um, but we've actually, the, uh, my experience has been uh, pretty positive with our VA in Pittsburgh uh, for uh, tours or even supporting uh, middle school events and things like that. Uh, we actually done some Boy Scout, Girl Scout, uh, you know, there's because there's an engineering merit badge, there's an invention merit badge, there's a, a disability studies merit badge. Um, there's equivalents for Girl Scouts. I'm a little biased because I was an Eagle Scout, but uh, um, they, uh, uh, and we did that through volunteer services and also the, the, through the VA education. Our argument has been that, uh, if you want to bring great VA, great people into the VA as employees, um, you need to let them know that you exist and what the and the and the great things that you're doing. Thank you. Any other questions from the group? I can hardly hear you. Is that better? Much better, much better. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say hi and to thank you for going to the work of putting this, uh, all this wonderful stuff together for us. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's great to have you on the, on, yeah, listen to me. It's, uh, uh, you know, as you know, Byron's an icon, right? I mean, he's, it, uh, he's done a tremendous amount for the, the veteran community. Uh, Ron, I think you're on mute still. There's a question in in the chat box, from okay. George Lombrecht. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and then I can. Yeah, we can. There we go. Ah, Decca's I bet, but so uh, in the interest of full disclosure, um, I'm I'm one of the uh, people that worked on the iBot with Dean Kamen. Uh, I can tell you some very interesting Dean Kamen stories if you. We want, and we worked on this. I worked on the Segway as well. Um, so yes. So actually, the iBot. Uh, so the MeBot is in some ways a, a response to the barriers that the iBot finished the, I faced. So the iBot's challenge was that. So I guess you should know the iBot is back on the market, and is uh, and the VA has purchased a few iBots. Uh, most of the iBots are purchased either through. Um, Voc Rehab, the VA, no fault insurance, uh, organization or self insured, or people paying cash. The problem the iBot has is that um, it is classified by the uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services as a Group Two power chair. And um, that's because it doesn't have sufficient, it doesn't have seat, doesn't have seat recline, and it doesn't have enough seat tilt to classify a seat tilt. And so the reimbursement level that it gets is less than what the iBot can basically be sold for. And so um, unfortunately, even the new version of the iBot doesn't address that, but at least the new business model for the iBot is, is that, um, uh, they're not trying to sell as many units as they needed to sell under the Johnson and Johnson umbrella. Um, the the problem I see is that it's really in some regard that um, centers for Medicare and Medicaid services, which are some are the lead payers, most insurance companies kind of follow their lead or their guidelines, um, doesn't take adequate, from my personal opinion, doesn't take adequate uh, consideration into and enhancing mobility in order to increase the, the reimbursement level. So the MeBot is focused on enhancing mobility, whereas in order to get adequate reimbursement, for example, our clinic in Pittsburgh and your clinic in Cleveland regularly prescribe wheelchairs that cost as much as the MeBot, but they have full powered seat functions, and as, as much as the iBot, I'm sorry. And they have powered seat, full powered seat functions, but iBot does not have the uh, adequate powered seat function. The other limitation of the iBot is that um, <coughs> to date it's not been offered with alternative controls, which also uh, is common in part of individuals who are more severely impaired. So um, that's a that's a business decision that iBot made. Uh, I think Johnson and Johnson at the time originally thought that they could. Uh, um, get uh, change uh, Medicare's interpretation of the policy. Uh, they were unsuccessful, I think, uh, and the, the revised uh, corporate model um, for the iBot is, uh, is to uh, <coughs> be able to, to survive off of a lower uh, volume of sales, at least initially. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I want to thank you, Rory, for a, an enlightening and uplifting presentation, you know, really showing us our marching orders, no matter our rehab engineering field, on advancing the needs of our patients with, with disabilities. Cheryl, if you could let us know who the, the date, because I can't recall off the top of my head, the date and speaker for our next NP seminar. Yes, it is January 14th, and it is Thomas Stiglitz. 
So um, uh, he will be joining us virtually um, for our NP seminar on January 14th. Wonderful. Thank Cheryl, you. it's so great to see you. You guys are so lucky. You've had Cheryl at the uh, FES Center for a long time. I mean, she's like an, it's like, like an anchor for your center there, right? <laughs> uh -oh. sure. anchor, anchor might not be a good word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Rory. Everyone have a wonderful holidays and everybody stay safe. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye, Rory. Good seeing you. Good seeing you. Thanks, Pat. All right, have a good night, Cheryl, and have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Huh? You too, Rory. It was great seeing you. That was a great, great time. Seeing you too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we will All see right. you soon, I hope. Hopefully, are you guys going to have the Ohio games, or are you just kind of playing it by ear this year? You know what? Um, I think they're waiting to see what happens, because um, usually we start meeting in January to determine. I know they have the dates scheduled, but uh, right. they're looking to see if uh, we're going to be able to. So hopefully enough people have the vaccine by then that we will. Yeah. Well, that's I'm gonna get in line, right? I know, exactly. Yep, we're ready. Yeah. We're scheduling them over here now. So um, hopefully we'll get it done soon. Awesome. All yeah. right. Take care. All right. We'll see you soon. Thank you. All right. Bye.